Welcome to Euro PCR uh, 23. My name is uh, Marko Noc. I'm coming from University Medical Center Ljubljana, Slovenia. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Tom Kibel from E6 uh, Cardiothoracic Center, London. And today uh, we will discuss or we will try to answer a very simple but complicated question. Uh, what is the best treatment of interventional, of course, for uh, the management of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So Tom, uh, welcome again. Uh, so let's start uh, from the beginning when we get a patient who is out-of-hospital cardiac arrest to the hospital. Uh, who should go directly to the cat lab? It's, it's a great question and it's, it's a tricky one sometimes. So I think what is fair to say is that I think if you have a post-ROSC uh, ECG with a STEMI, I think the guidelines and most of us would want to take that patient directly to angiography, open up that artery, get flow back, and I think it is highly likely that they will do better as a result of that. The only thing to say is that if we have concerns about big brain injury, and that may be assessed by a Miracle 2 score, then actually taking that person to the catheter lab might not change the overarching outcome, but at the same time, usually we would still go about trying to fix the coronary, but understanding that that still might not fix the patient. So I think that's important. So I think that STEMI almost invariably should go to the cath lab, but, but consider neurological injury. I think the more challenging ones in decision making are the ones without ST elevation. So again, if you have a VF arrest, you have good CPR, you have return of spontaneous circulation, but without STEMI, then they're gonna to come to your center and the decision making is a little more tricky. Um, there are a number of trials, Tomahawk, COAP, that suggest no benefit by going to the catheter lab and that now is reflected in guidance. But I think that we need to propose a more personalized approach to how we deal with these patients to try and pick patients in a slightly more personalized and elegant way that may well benefit from an interventional approach early on rather than maybe when they go back to the ICU without going to the cath lab, have ongoing ischemia, maybe have a further VF arrest or develop a hemodynamic shock. So I think that when we have patients without ST elevation, the cath lab should be considered in those patients who have a low Miracle 2 score, so a good chance of neurological in, uh, recovery, in those that are shocked, I think there's some evidence to support that too, and in patients that you suspect a high suspicion of coronary culprit, that you know that you can probably make, make that better. So can you briefly summarize, so you mentioned a couple of times Miracle score, so what, what, uh, what this makes uh, in this process of decision making? Yeah, so Miracle score has been validated uh, in, in a worldwide setting and it's a scoring system on admission to hospital that takes into consideration and has a score up to 10. Um, and it takes things like age, whether you gave adrenaline, the pH, and a number of other things which, uh, which you can see. Um, and a score of zero to three would suggest that you are likely to have a good neurological outcome at six months. So these are predominantly the patients uh, who are really favorites, so to say, Absolutely. for the cat lab because, because their neurological recovery is very likely. Absolutely right. And so their brain injury is much more likely to be more modest and that if you actually intervene upon them, that you are likely to make a benefit. Those who have a more intermediate miracle score of maybe four or five, they're starting to get to the point where their outcome of neurological injury is likely to be maybe death at six months of 60%, something like that, so much higher. So they probably stand less to gain from an invasive approach. And to be fair, once you get six and above on the scoring system, I think it's fair to say that you're near 90% chance of neurological injury and death at six months it really is a very difficult thing to argue that you're going to change their outcome by taking them to the catheter lab. So what I'm hearing is, is that, you know, we have some guidelines according to ECG, according to the miracle score, but this should be used rather as a tools than the rules in our decision-making process. I think that's exactly right. And I think if we can try and personalize it for each patient that comes in front of us in a multidisciplinary way when they arrive, I think we can derive benefit to our patients. Okay, Tom, now actually you did your current geography, you find the culprit lesion. Yeah. So let's discuss the strategy. So what would you do in the cat lab uh, with these patients? What kind of strategies? Is it any different from, you know, your regular cases? It's definitely different in that I think the simpler you can keep it, the better. And I think what I mean by that is 
I want to wire it, I want to then restore flow, and once I've restored flow, then I make a decision about what I need to do. We know that stent thrombosis rates in these patients can be as high as 20%, and so you know, putting stents in may run into problems in these patients who are intensive care patients, intubated, ventilated, previously have had temperature management, et cetera, and they don't absorb the medications that we give them. And so I think keeping things very simple is the way forward. Um, if we need to stent, that's fine, but it's, it is about flow. And I think that we should not do areas, non-culprit areas, more complicated PCI in this setting, because it's highly likely we're going to run into problems, more problems. And so I think the first thing is keep it as simple as you can within the remits of that patient and that anatomy. So flow-directed intervention yep. on the culprit artery. Definitely. This would be the summary. That would definitely be my summary, yes. Okay. Of course, once you, you know, put the stand, then of course we are talking about anticoagulation, anti-aggregation, and these are intubated patients, unconscious patients, patients on sedation, on algesia, vasopressors if you want, inotropes. So how would you manage that if you put the stand in the cat lab uh, further on? Yeah, well I think this remains still a little bit of a challenge for all of us actually, both availability of some drugs can be a challenge, but I think the key thing is that in the catheter lab, put an NG tube down in the catheter lab, screen it, see where your ET tube is, see where your NG tube is, make sure it's in the right place and usable. Then you can give your dual antiplatelet therapy, whichever is available in your, in your unit. Um, I think we can give aspirin either down the uh, NG tube or as an IV preparation. And then I think depending on access to drugs and also the, the, what, what disease you're dealing with. But in essence, I think if you give them down the NG tube, you're going to want to obviously either make them crushed or soluble so that you can get the best absorption that you can in, with that patient co cohort. But we know that absorption and antiplatelet activity is a real problem. Um, and so sometimes we need to use intravenous uh, agents in addition to obviously uh, heparin that we're going to give to everybody that we're going to perform, perform PCI. So it would be a situation which would favor the use of, let's say, uh, intravenous agents? Yeah, so I think if you've got a really high thrombus burden mm -hmm. and you're really struggling to get that flow back with, you know, it's opening, closing, opening, closing, and you're really struggling to get that thrombus out with thrombectomy or, or other techniques, then I think those are the types of patients, but you must weigh it up with the risk of bleeding. So some of these patients will have had 30 minutes of CPR, and so they may have injury to lung, they may have injury to the pericardium, they may have injury to their liver. And so again, when we give these intravenous uh, powerful agents, we have to be mindful that there is some bleeding there, that we have to be clear that the consequences are worthwhile in the overarching benefit of that patient. And I think that's a real challenging decision. So I think if you can avoid using intravenous uh, 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 drugs in the terms of antiplatelet agents, I think that's probably a good thing. But I think we have to accept that in com more complex uh, PCI and in more complicated thrombus burden patients, we may well need some. And mm -hmm. we have to just take that. And uh, last but not the least, let's touch also the patients, you know, who have CPR on the field, but the CPR is not successful. So there's no reestablishment of spontaneous circulation in the field. Yeah. And these patients actually nowadays in some centers come to the hospital with ongoing chest compression. So is there any way we can help them? Yeah, definitely. So look, I think the key thing is patient selection. So with, we want to pick patients who it's a witnessed cardiac arrest. There is immediate CPR, good CPR. There are obviously attempts generally at defibrillation in VF patients. And that then that those patients come to a center capable of delivering uh, more therapies, but not only that, they do a lot and they do a lot quickly. And I think the pathway that has been particularly successful is one that uh, these patients who are well selected come directly to a catheter lab on mechanical CPR devices and slickly and quickly get access to the arterial system, the venous system with big cannula, and then they go on to ECMO. And then once the patient's on ECMO, then you have the ability to oxygenate their brain, oxygenate their tissues, and then you can do whatever treatment is required, which may well be PCI to their left main stem, but you have secured brain uh, uh, oxygenation, tissue oxygenation, and all of a sudden that transforms the patient into one that can tolerate that procedure and a brain, hopefully, that is going to then wake up afterwards. And I think the, that, that system, it, with the speed and with the technical abilities within a catheter lab, can, we know, probably 
survive maybe 20 to 30 percent of these patients where without that they would 100 percent of the time die and I think that is game changing but it requires very careful uh, selection very good trained teams and systems uh, to make that happen uh, reliably. And where do we see the role of intervention cardiologists in this, uh, I would say, post-resuscitation or better yet resuscitation team? Well, I think that what we are good at is uh, we're, we're good with the critically unwell patient and we're good working in teams with critically unwell patients. We have excellent access to arteries and veins in a high volume fashion. Many of us will be large bore operators for TAVI and for other uh, large bore techniques. And so I think the interventional cardiologist lends themselves very nicely to putting in big tubes safely, because let's not pretend if we do this you know, in a slapdash manner, we can cause much more harm than good. And so we need to have ultrasound guided punctures, know exactly where we are, put these cannulas in with real skill and, 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 and safety. And then I think we can derive the best possible outcomes for this patient group. So I think we are front and center of this, this journey. Because another thing is if acute coronary cause is suspected after you put a patient on ECMO, then you don't bring a patient to ICU. You just continue with coronary geography and do your PCI. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, then you've got everything in a very controlled environment. And then you can go back to the ICU revascularized, still on the ECMO, still with a good perfusion and oxygenation. And then that can then be slowly uh, reduced and withdrawn over time in, in line with their hemodynamics. Well, Tom, thanks so much uh, for your, your explanations. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invite.